Level 1. The Gentleman's Dispute. Girolamo Cardano versus Niccolo Tartaglia. The Cubic Equation Betrayal. Cardano and Tartaglia weren't just solving equations. They were fighting for immortality in a world where a single formula could make you legend. The rivalry began with a promise broken, a secret sold, and a grudge that poisoned Italian mathematics for decades. In 1535, Tartaglia discovered the solution to cubic equations, revolutionary, career-defining. He kept it secret, knowing that in Renaissance Italy, mathematical challenges were public spectacles where reputations were won or destroyed. Cardano begged for the formula, swearing a solemn oath never to publish it. Tartaglia believed him. Mistake. In 1545, Cardano published Ars Magna, revealing Tartaglia's method to the world. The betrayal was absolute. Tartaglia exploded with rage, publishing venomous attacks calling Cardano a thief and liar. Cardano responded that he'd found earlier proof from Del Ferro, making Tartaglia's claim invalid anyway. The mathematical community split. Accusations flew in published treatises. Both men recruited allies. The dispute consumed years of their lives. Yet beneath the hatred, both were brilliant. Cardano's Ars Magna became one of the great mathematical texts of the Renaissance. Tartaglia's work on ballistics changed military engineering. This is rivalry at its most Renaissance. Honor-bound, bitter, and fought with ink instead of swords. Level 2. The Notation Wars. Isaac Newton versus Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. The Calculus Priority Dispute. When two geniuses independently invent the mathematical language that will define science itself, and neither can bear to share the glory. This wasn't about a single theorem. This was about who would be remembered as the mind that unlocked the mathematics of change, motion, and the infinite. Newton developed his method of fluxions in the 1660s but didn't publish. Obsessively secretive, paranoid about criticism, he kept his revolutionary mathematics hidden in private notebooks. Leibniz, working independently in the 1670s, developed his own calculus with superior notation, the DX and DY symbols we still use today. He published first in 1684. Newton's allies exploded. How dare this German claim credit for English genius? The Royal Society, dominated by Newton's supporters, launched an investigation in 1712. The verdict? Leibniz was a plagiarist. The evidence? Secretly written by Newton himself. The committee investigating Leibniz's theft was rigged from the start. Leibniz fired back in letters, accusing Newton of arrogance and claiming priority through publication. Newton responded by anonymously writing brutal reviews of Leibniz's work, dismantling his rival's reputation while pretending to be an objective observer. The battle became national. England rallied behind Newton. Continental Europe defended Leibniz. For decades, British mathematicians refused to use Leibniz's superior notation out of pure spite, crippling their own mathematical development while the continent advanced. Leibniz died in 1716, bitter and largely forgotten. Newton had won. But history's verdict is more nuanced. Both discovered calculus independently. Leibniz's notation survived because it was simply better. The irony? Newton's institutional power gave him victory, but Leibniz's symbols conquered mathematics forever. Level 3. Institutional Annihilation. Everest Galois versus the French Academy. When the mathematical establishment decides you're too young, too radical, and too difficult to understand, they don't just reject your work, they bury you alive. Galois didn't have a rival mathematician. He had an entire institution determined to destroy him. In 1829, at age 17, Galois submitted groundbreaking work on polynomial equations to the French Academy of Sciences. Augustin Louis Cauchy, the examiner, lost the papers. Just lost them. Revolutionary mathematics, gone. Galois rewrote everything and submitted again in 1830, this time to Joseph Fourier, the Academy's secretary. Fourier died. The manuscript vanished with his papers. Twice, the mathematical establishment had erased Galois. In 1831, Galois tried one final time, submitting to Simeon Denis Poisson. Poisson rejected it, claiming the work was incomprehensible and needed clarification. The incomprehensible work? Group theory, the foundation of modern abstract algebra. Galois had invented an entirely new branch of mathematics, and the old guard couldn't understand it, so they dismissed him. Rage consumed Galois. He became a Republican revolutionary, was arrested twice, imprisoned for political activism. Mathematics had abandoned him, so he turned to politics and fury. May 30, 1832, age 20. Galois died in a duel over a woman, though some historians suspect political assassination. 
The night before, knowing he might die, he frantically wrote letters explaining his mathematical discoveries, scribbling I have no time in the margins. Fourteen years later, Joseph Liouville finally read Galois' papers and recognized their genius. By then, Galois was long dead, buried in an unmarked common grave. The French Academy hadn't just rejected him. They'd killed the future of mathematics and let it rot. Level 4. The Philosophy of Infinity Georg Cantor versus Leopold Kronecker When your mathematics challenges the very nature of infinity and reality itself, and your former mentor decides you're not just wrong, you're insane. Cantor discovered that some infinities are bigger than others, that there are different sizes of infinity, hierarchies of the uncountable. Set theory, transfinite numbers, the mathematics that would revolutionize logic and foundations. Kronecker, his former teacher, declared it madness. God made the integers, all else is the work of man, Kronecker famously proclaimed. Cantor's infinite sets were, to Kronecker, mathematical heresy. What began as philosophical disagreement became personal destruction. Kronecker used his institutional power at the University of Berlin to block Cantor's publications, delayed journals printing his work, and publicly mocked him at conferences. He called Cantor a corrupter of youth and a scientific charlatan. Cantor fought back in print, but Kronecker controlled the German mathematical establishment. Papers were rejected, positions were denied. Cantor, stuck at the Provincial University of Halle, watched lesser mathematicians receive the Berlin appointments he deserved. The intellectual isolation and repeated rejection shattered him. Cantor suffered his first mental breakdown in 1884. Depression, paranoia, hospitalization. He would spend the rest of his life cycling between brilliance and madness, in and out of sanatoriums. He died in 1918, poor and broken, in a psychiatric hospital during World War I. Kronecker died in 1891, never accepting Cantor's work. But within two decades, set theory became the foundation of modern mathematics. Cantor's infinite hierarchies are now taught to undergraduates. Kronecker is remembered primarily for being wrong. The tragedy? Cantor never lived to see his vindication. Level 5. Cold War Mathematics Andrei Kolmogorov versus the Soviet system When your rival isn't a person but an entire totalitarian regime that demands mathematics serve the state, and purity of thought becomes treason. Kolmogorov was the Soviet Union's greatest mathematician. Probability theory, topology, turbulence, his contributions were staggering. The Soviet system didn't just reject certain mathematics, it purged mathematicians. Colleagues disappeared to gulags for teaching bourgeois set theory. Geneticists were executed for contradicting Lysenko's state-approved pseudoscience. Kolmogorov watched brilliant minds vanish. He made a calculated choice, survival through compromise. He praised Stalin in official speeches, joined the Communist Party and carefully framed his work in ideologically acceptable language. Publicly loyal, privately defiant, he protected students from persecution, sheltered unacceptable mathematical ideas within approved research, and built a refuge for pure mathematics within the system designed to destroy it. His rival, the informant Pavel Alexandrov? No, Alexandrov was his partner in this careful dance. The real enemy was the ideology that treated theorems like political statements. His students were sometimes denied degrees for political reason. He died in 1987, two years before the Soviet collapse. Level 6. The Proof from Hell Andrew Wiles versus Pierre de Fermat's ghost. When your rival has been dead for 358 years, but his unsolved theorem haunts every mathematician who dares attempt it, and failure means joining a graveyard of broken careers. Fermat's last theorem, 1637. Fermat scribbled in a margin. I have discovered a truly marvelous proof, but this margin is too narrow to contain it. For over three centuries, that note taunted mathematics. The theorem seemed simple. No three positive integers a, b, and c can satisfy a uh, to the power of n plus b to the power of n equals c to the power of n for any integer n greater than 2. Proving it? Impossible. Hundreds tried. Leonhard Euler proved it for n equals 3. Sophie Germain made progress. Each generation attacked it with new tools and failed. Careers ended in obsession. Reputations died in flawed proofs. Andrew Wiles discovered Fermat's last theorem at age 10 and decided his life would be spent solving it. In 1986, he learned that proving the Taniyama Shimura conjecture would prove Fermat. He went underground. For seven years, Wiles worked in complete secrecy in his attic, telling no one, publishing nothing. Isolation, obsession, everything staked on a problem that had destroyed everyone before him. June 1993, Cambridge. Wiles announced the proof in three lectures. The mathematical world exploded. 
Media frenzy? Global headline. Andrew Wiles had done the impossible. Then, disaster? Reviewer Nick Katz found a gap in the proof. Not a small error, a fundamental flaw. Wiles' proof didn't work. The humiliation was public and total. For 14 months, Wiles tried desperately to fix it. Depression. Desperation. The brink of failure. September 1994. A flash of insight. Richard Taylor, his former student, helped bridge the gap. The proof was complete. 108 pages, published in 1995. Fermat's last theorem was solved. Wiles had beaten a ghost, but the cost was a decade of his life in isolation, risking everything on a problem that had devoured every mathematician who challenged it. Level 7. The Foundations of Reality David Hilbert versus Kurt Gödel When you build a program to make mathematics perfectly complete and consistent, and the young logician proves it's impossible, shattering the dream of mathematical certainty forever. 1900. Paris David Hilbert presented 23 unsolved problems to define mathematics for the new century. His vision? Mathematics as a complete, consistent, formal system where every true statement could be proven. Absolute certainty. Perfect foundations. Hilbert's program would make mathematics invincible. For three decades, the greatest minds worked toward Hilbert's dream. Then came Gödel. 1931. Kurt Gödel, a shy 25-year-old logician, published his incompleteness theorems. The first theorem, the second, Hilbert was devastated. His life's work, destroyed by a younger man's logic. But he couldn't refute Gödel because Gödel was mathematically correct. Hilbert died in 1943, his dream of complete mathematical certainty in ruins. Gödel lived until 1978, descending into paranoia and madness, eventually starving himself to death from fear of poisoning. Both men were destroyed by the question of mathematical truth. This wasn't a rivalry of ego or priority. This was a fight over reality itself. Can truth be fully known? Gödel proved it cannot. Hilbert's mathematics was magnificent but incomplete. Forever.